right. So I had someone reach out to me recently and ask me where in the heck do we check subcooling on VRF systems? More importantly, where the heck do we check subcooling when the unit is in parallel operation? And it's a great question because again, these systems are pretty complex. And uh, as usual, let's just jump into the refrigeration circuit really quickly. So this is a heat recovery system. Now, obviously, heat pumps will have less components, uh, but they, everything in VRF, for the most part, has this beautiful valve right here. This is the electronic expansion valve for the subcooling circuit. The subcooling circuit is not designed to just be the only thing subcooling liquid refrigerant, but it's designed to give on-demand vapor back to the suction line for the inverter compressor for all those lead lag scenarios and situations that we get ourselves into with VRF and having lots of indoor units. Okay, so we know what the subcooling circuit is. We've watched other videos and we know the three pillars because we've watched that video about a million times. I need to remake that still. But the three pillars tell us discharge superheat. Well, actually, I like to go in the order of compression. Suction superheat, discharge superheat, subcooling. Now, system subcooling is important to measure because it also helps us understand the quality of liquid being created by our heat exchanger. Not so much the quantity, but more so the quality is what I'm looking for. So where do we check it? Usually, you're checking it here in cooling, right? And usually, you're checking it somewhere close to the indoor unit and heating, right? We want to know the efficiency of that coil, knowing what it's doing and what that looks like. Did it did it subcool it by two degrees? Did it subcool it by five degrees? Did it subcool it by a hundred degrees? I've seen it. I've seen some things, okay? Don't ask me to explain it. I have flashbacks. But system subcooling is one of those important things to, to understand where we check it is one of the most important things, right? We need we know we need it, right? I need it. I need the subcooling of the system. The question is, where are you checking it? Because that's the other big thing. A lot of guys and not placing any blame here, guys. We all started somewhere, but understanding where to check it is the biggest thing. Because you get you get out there and you get rolling and you're like, man, yeah, suction superheat, discharge superheat. You get into subcooling and it's like, yeah, this diagnosis makes no sense. It was looking low charge, low charge, and now it's looking overcharged. How does that make any sense? This, this makes no sense at all. Well, come to find out I'm actually checking at the wrong spot. So let's go through the really easy ones, cooling, heating, and then jump into parallel operation. All right. So in actual cooling mode, cooling mode, we're taking the outdoor gas, the, the hot gas coming off the actual compressors, coming out of the compressors, going into the outdoor heat exchangers, and we're turning it to a, a liquid. So we're usually checking it here. And again, in that process, you can also check combined liquid, which is both this heat exchanger and this heat exchanger together here. This is your liquid receiver inlet temp on your service checker. Now, where are we not going to check it? We are not going to check it here, which is your subcooled heat exchanger liquid temp. And you say, okay, well, duh, I already know that. Cooling is the easiest thing to check it in. Well, what about heating? When well, heating, the liquid is actually flowing the opposite direction. And sometimes it's just easier to just show you with these beautiful colors on my screen. With liquid going in the opposite direction, where are we measuring subcooling? Well, we're not measuring it here. That makes no sense. And we're definitely not doing it here because that's a saturated vapor. We should be checking it. Oh, that's where it's at. There. That is the subcooled liquid heat exchanger. Subcooled heat exchanger liquid temp is the actual official name for it. Why are we checking it here? Because again, if I check it here on the right-hand side as opposed to here on the left-hand side, you'll find that something beautiful and magical happens, right? When a mommy and a daddy love each other. Just kidding. This is not that video. The subcooler puts in some serious work. This is subcooler is the underdog of VRF systems because this is why. It's designed to, again, give on-demand vapor to the actual outdoor unit, but it allows us to circulate refrigerant without ever leaving the outdoor unit. That's right. We're, we're bypassing heat exchangers because we got our own heat exchanger right here. Some on VRV3, it's a tube and tube. VRV4, it's a plate to plate, which is a little bit more efficient. It's in a smaller package, a little bit more bang for your buck there. But again, the process is this. Low pressure, saturated vapor goes to the plate to plate heat exchanger after the EEV. This is the subcool EEV. And it turns into a vapor, that beautiful metamorphosis of the liquid refrigerant into vapor, again, creates an exchange of temperature in here, right? We're creating a bunch of BTUs that we can load up, right? Where are we going to put it? We're going to put it in the liquid line. So the liquid coming in here is 70 degrees from our indoor unit. Not impressive at all. But then it goes through this process. Do, 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 elevator music. And here, wow, there we go. We made it. And it goes through here. Well, what happened in that process? Well, when it was 70 coming into the machine, and it comes out the other side, guess what? It's actually 60 degrees now. 
Where did that temperature come from? How did it drop 10 degrees? Well, it dropped 10 degrees because it went through this plate to plate heat exchanger in our sub cooler. Oh, that's why we check liquid here in heating and not here in heating, right? Because again, measuring this is going to give me a lower temperature, which is going to give me a higher subcooling number, which is going to tell me the system might be overcharged or that my undercharge is being masked by a subcooler. That's right. Subcoolers can actually mask overcharge and undercharge because again, they are manipulative, right? These manipulative little valves, they manipulate the refrigerant and they add temperature to um, that actual or add temperature to the vapor leaving, but they, they remove temperature from the liquid line. So by leaching temperature from the liquid line, it's going to skew your numbers if you're checking in the wrong spot. Okay. Cooling, heating, parallel operation. So let's do parallel operation. And this animation is not going to be great because parallel operation is a wild mother. I tell you what, parallel operation does what it wants, when it wants, how it wants, however it wants to. And it is just doesn't live by any rules. And so with parallel operation, you could have liquid going this way and then it going this way and it's going this way and it's going this way. And you're like, well, whoa, 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 whoa. What? It goes, it goes this way and then, and then it goes this way. It's going this way and this, and this way. Well, how do we, how am I supposed to measure that? Like this is already complex enough. And now you're telling me that, that this way and this way and that way is not the best. Um, how does that make any sense? And I will tell you how it makes sense. That was a really like dramatic pause for effect there for you is <laughs> because we're going to learn how to fix this. Okay. So we know where this is at and now we know where this is at and we know what they're called, right? Right one here, leaving our combined liquid is our liquid receiver temp. Okay. Writing that down, scribbling it. Okay. You heard that. This is my sub cooled heat exchanger liquid temp. These two sensors are going to tell us which way it's flowing. How is that possible? Well, if I know that this is 70 and this is 80, which way is it flowing? This way. Yeah, it's going to the indoor units. Oh, wow. Well, that makes sense because the temperature drop is from there to there. Okay. Well, what if this is 70 degrees and what if this is 60 degrees? Well, the temperature is actually coming from the indoor units to the outdoor unit. Oh, it all makes sense now. We're measuring temperature differential between these two sensors to determine the direction of liquid refrigerant in parallel operation. Wow, just blew your mind. I might just blew my own mind. And I already know this stuff. What does that look like in the data? Because that's the real big question that you want to ask here. Let me get really big for you in your face. Now we want to know what data blinds to plot. Well, first of all, you got to make sure your system's in parallel operation and check. Okay. So our thermostat says it's on and check. Unit is running. Good. We need those two things going so we can actually get this going. Subcooled valve. Well, again, I can't measure temperature across the subcooler if the subcooled valve isn't open because then it's not adding any saturated vapor to the opposite line and doing its job and putting in the work. So there's no reason to measure the two different two temperature differentials between them. Plot that on the map. Add to the board. Okay. Now, where are we going? We're going to, where are we going? Here we go. Liquid receiver inlet temp, number 74. Uh, B74. This one is 96.8 degrees. Plotting that temp. The next one is going to be 78. Subcooled heat exchanger liquid temp. It's almost like I already know what these sensors are called. 77 degrees. So let's jump through this data really quickly in a few different spots and see what's doing what and why. Okay, here we go. These are pulses open and system running. Great. Love it. What is our temperatures? 86 degrees, remember, on the right-hand side and 64 on the left. Which way is the liquid going? It's going from the outdoor unit to the indoor units at this particular time on the unit. Okay, great. Now I know where to measure subcooling for this particular spot in the data set. Okay, let's jump somewhere else. Let's jump where the lines actually flippity floppity. Yes, and that is a scientific term in case you're wondering. The lines have now gone to the opposite directions. Well, why would they do that? Because the liquid is going in the different direction. It's changed direction. It said, I'm going this way. No, no, way. I was just kidding. I'm going that way. Lost my, forgot my keys. Here we are. 70, 70 degrees, 69.8. Let's split hairs here. And 80 degrees. That's a 10 degree difference. Well, we know that this is coming into my unit, right? Not, that was a trick question. You failed. You said, yeah, I heard you. 
This is actually coming into my unit. Red line's coming into my unit, 80.6 degrees. And then leaving my subcooler, going to my outdoor heat exchanger is 69.8 degrees. This means that my liquid is leaving from my indoor unit to my outdoor unit. That is the direction of flow. Now, here's something else that's really cool about the subcool valve, because I just think everything about VRF is really cool. And the subcool valve shows us the pulses open. Now, look at the major, dramatic, drastic changes to the actual liquid line with the subcool valve. So now the subcool valve opens up and it says, yeah, whatever, I don't care, 120 pulses. Okay, cool. Now we see which way the liquid's flowing. 95 at the outdoor uh, heat exchanger, right? That's our liquid receiver. And we have 69.8 entering or, or leaving our unit. And these two differentials tells us the liquid's going from the outdoor unit to the indoor units. Okay, we know the direction of flow now. Well, now it goes to close. Okay, whatever. It does what it wants. I really can't control it. And so what, what is this, right? It bumps up and then it closes and then it bumps up and then it closes and it bumps up and it closes. And these are actually little 40 pulse, little bumps, little, little speed bumps in the road. Look at the drastic change it has to the actual liquid line, right? We we're, we're the peak of this one is 78 degrees. And then we hit what? 59 degrees. And then we go, whoa, 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 91 degrees. And then we go opposite end of the spectrum here. We are at 57 degrees, 91 to 57, boom, like that in a matter of 60 seconds. Why is that happening? Because we can see that anytime this valve opens up, right, and then it closes, it warms up. And then it opens, and then we have a drop in temperature, and then it warms up. And then it opens, and we have a drop in temperature. These drastic drops in temperature at low pulses is two indications, right? And this one's a freebie for you guys. The two indications are that, that this is is either overcharged and too much liquid is getting by at 40 pulses or the more realistic idea here or, or terminology or whatever you want to call it, the reality, thank you, that's the word, the reality of this system is that there is just really low flow. Remember, VRF is variable refrigerant flow, right? Variable refrigerant volume. I don't care which flag you fly. They're both the same thing, okay? I'm tired of carrying that torch. With this being said, this tells me that, again, small pallet pulses open and large dramatic temperature changes with the subcooler, subcooling circuit. That's what this is. This is a part of the subcooling circuit. Tells me that the flow through that valve, that flow through that plate-to-plate -plate heat exchanger on the opposite side, the liquid side, is really, really low. So I would combine that with actual RPS amount right here, compressor speeds, and say, well, if the compressor is running really low, then that makes sense. So again... This is telling me now the speed and volume of my refrigerant. So not only can I tell you which way it's going, I can also tell you how much is flowing through that line. What? You can actually tell how much is flowing through that line right now. Tell me exactly how many ounces are through that line. No, I can't tell you how many ounces are flowing through this line right now, but I can tell you that the volume is low and the flow is low. Those two things together, which is not what we like in VRF, we like the right amount of volume and the right amount of flow, if the demand is high inside, I would question why is the flow so low, right? Why is the flow so low? And the reason I would ask that question is because, again, if the demand is high, my compressor speeds are low, and all of a sudden I go and I look at <clears throat> where to actually check subcooling, I might find that it's hitting its targets just fine, but it's just kind of just humming away at those targets, and that's not that's not enough. The system needs more, right? It's not able to actually meet the demand within the system. And I'm just going to plot it now because I'm in too deep. Um, if it's hitting the targets that it's supposed to at that specific point in time with a high demand at 40 RPS and my subcool valve looks like this and my temperature differential across my subcooling circuit for my liquid line looks like this, I know 100% from science that there is no flow through this unit. And why would there be no flow through this unit and hitting targets overcharged, right? That's finger guns right there. Overcharge. That's exactly what that is. This is how we use the subcooling circuit to peel this onion back. There it is. Yeah. You guys love it to determine if the system is actually overcharged. Now there's other ways, right? Right. There's the, the suction super eat, discharge super eat, subcooling. And now we know where to check system subcooling, but I'm just saying that the subcool valve data is here. This information is here for you to use to determine flow, which way it's going, and also to determine volume and velocity through that circuit. This is the liquid line. There's all no other liquid lines in this system. This is the main liquid line of the system. All liquid passes through here. So 
Why is that important? Because liquid is one of the most important things in the system and moving it from point A to point B at the right speed is also very important. So if the demand is high and the flow is low and I'm meeting my targets, I don't even need to check subcooling. I mean, I'm going to because I like to check all the boxes here in OCD. But this tells me that the system is overcharged. This looks like a heart rate monitor that is not a good thing. So this is how you use the subcooling circuit in all of its capacities. Not only cooling, heating for checking that number that I taught you to use, but also parallel operation, valve pulses, temperature differential, and most importantly, determining liquid flow on the system, right? This is something that you're not going to get anywhere else because, again, this, is, this actual circuit is designed to manipulate the refrigerant temperature of the liquid line. And its ability to do that is really, it's really good. It's actually, it's very good at it, actually. And so this is just helping me understand what's actually taking place in the system. Now, obviously, I'm not going to just take this one single piece of data snippet and say it's overcharged. I'm actually going to work through the process here of going through all of it and figuring out all the other pieces and, and going forwards and going backwards and forwards and backwards. And actually, it looks very messy. Um, I didn't actually troubleshoot this piece of data outside of just trying to find a good example of what the subcooling valve does and how to use it in troubleshooting. So drop me some comments, add some likes, guys. Not even sure how to say that. Um, send me some more uh, comments. Tell me what you guys are looking for. I, I genuinely want to know what you guys want to know more about. I am here to help. I am here to answer questions. I am here to make more videos to make this an easier process for you so that anytime you go out to a VRF service call and you watch one of these videos, you feel more confident in discovering what's really going on in the system and getting down to the brass tacks of what is really wrong with the system and how to fix it and correct it. Because again, this stuff is still just refrigeration, guys. We're just peeling it back one circuit at a time, one piece at a time, and this is the subcooling circuit. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it and actually start using it when you're looking through data. So I will see you guys on the next one. Thanks.